In other words, you're asking yourself, well, how can I get from point A to point B? I need to grow. What are you talking to me about being a discipler? I need to grow. You may feel that way, but you know, chances are you actually know more than you think you do, and God can use you. Amen. Hi, I'm Ron Hammonds, and this is Life Shape Prayer and Discipleship. I want to thank you for joining with us today. And as you add this block to your life, realize that God is building His kingdom in you. And what you will hear today is very important to that process. I also want to encourage you to add an element of prayer to your life, specifically strategic prayer built around 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, God said. Then I will forgive their sins and then I will heal their lands. You know, God was serious when He said that, and He's serious about that today. This truth is being echoed around the nation and throughout the world. God is calling us to humble prayer and strategic discipleship. Set aside some dedicated time. Offer yourself to God. I know if we will, He will. God bless you. Thanks again for joining us here at LifeShape. Well, tonight our subject is on discipleship. Everybody say discipleship. And our key scripture tonight is from 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Let's just get into the word of God, shall we? Amen. I'll tell you, I'll just love all of these lessons. And in case you're wondering, you can always go to ifmypeoplewill.com and uh, get all of the, the current notes. You can uh, watch the videos and and all of that sort of thing. So if you've missed any of the blocks of truth that we've been trying to lay every Wednesday night, uh, you, are, you are well able to, to look at them and download the notes and, and follow along, amen, and sort of get caught up. Chris, we've sure been praying for you. Chris was in a serious motor vehicle wreck the other day. Actually, Sunday afternoon, his vehicle um, flipped multiple times, um, and two of his young babies were inside the car. And, uh, but by the grace of God, the Lord's protecting hand upon him, they all survived. Uh, Chris has got a pretty big gash in one of his legs, but uh, he's going to heal up and the kids are fine. And so we give praise to God for that. Amen. And uh, just keep praying for him. Amen. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2, and I'm going to read it to you from the New English Translation, which is a translation I like, and uh, there are many others, of course. And in trust although not everything I say is gonna be from that tonight. But entrust what you say, what you heard me say in the presence of many others as witnesses to faithful people who will be competent to teach others as well. This is very important for us to understand that it is God's will for us to take what we know about Jesus and to give it away, give it to somebody else, amen. And uh, this is not just the, uh, the place of preachers and pastors and whatever to do this. This is the call of God, obviously on pastors and preachers, Paul talking to Timothy, a pastor in Ephesus. But more than that, it is a call to all of us because Jesus told us in Matthew 28 in what we call the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, and in, in, when you read that in, in Greek, make disciples is the main thought of the whole phrase right there. Make disciples is the main thought of the Great Commission. Not just preaching the gospel, but making disciples. Amen. Now what is a disciple? Well, a di disciple is a disciplined follower, a learner, if you will. And uh, so God wants us to make uh, take people who are faithful, who love the Lord, and to encourage them and help them develop in the things of God and bring them along to where they too then can make disciples. Amen. Because if the generation, listen, if this church ends with uh, the death of Pastor Ron Hammonds, for example, a terrible and a tragic day and yet a wonderful day, amen, uh, for God's glory. But if the church ended at the death of Pastor Ron, that would be a terrible tragedy. Do you know why? Because 
If, in other words, if he never raised up any more disciples under him or other leadership, secondary leadership to take over after, what would have happened had Paul and the rest of the apostles not raised up other people, other followers, other disciplined tutor, uh, under disciplined followers of Christ, had they not raised it up, then you and I wouldn't be here. The church would no longer be in existence. And so we all must raise up learners or students that we are discipling in the ways of God, not just teaching them facts and information about the Bible, although that is important, but imparting to them the reason and the motivation of your heart as to why you serve God today. And if you're not serving God, well, it's a good time to start. You've got to tell it to the next generation. The old adage is there's no success without a successor. One of the problems in America right now is according to a recent census, the recent census data, is that there are about three million children in America that are growing up in homes without a father. That means we are essentially, for three million children, we are essentially a mentorless society. Not that moms are not do capable of doing a great job, but they are missing that male leadership model in their life, and no wonder America is in a predicament. We need to then restore our mentorship and our discipleship in our generation in order to ensure that the church will continue on, amen? amen. Acts eleven twenty six says, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. First called Christians at at Antioch. This was a Gentile church, and God had done tre tremendous things there, so much so that this is uh, the first indication we have in the book of Acts that, that, uh, that now they're beginning to distinguish more clearly the difference between the early uh, Christian church and the church as it progressed through the first uh, couple of decades in its, in its uh, infancy. And uh, we, we're, they're now beginning to separate Christians from Jews because early on, uh, the, the Christians and Jews were basically viewed as one sect. But then as time progressed and more and more Gentiles came into the church, then it sort of took on a, a bit of a different flavor. And in the mind of the people that were in charge, the rulers and that sort of thing, they began to realize that the Christians were not exactly the same as the Jewish sect in their mind, okay? And so they're first called Christians. It's in interesting to me that... They, the, these Christ followers, these Christ followers were disciples, amen. And it was because of their, their, learn, their learning about the ways of God and the ways of Christ that they began to be identified as Christians. Acts eleven twenty five and 26, so Barnabas, what had happened was because there was such a, an amazing uh, amount of disciples in Antioch, and it was growing and growing, and Barnabas was there, and he was a good man, full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and he encouraged them and the things of God, and the church was doing great, but sooner or later, Barnabas is looking around for some help, and of course, Saul, who had gotten saved dramatically on the road to Damascus, by the way, isn't that interesting, Saul gets saved on the road to Damascus, and where is Damascus today? Syria. So, when you pray about Syria and you think about Syria, remember that God did a tremendous work in Syria, even under the authority of an authoritarian regime, and pray that God would do the same thing in our day. Amen? Amen. Think about it biblically rather than just in, in terms of geo, geopolitics, okay? Think what God may be orchestrating among the nations because he's doing a great work. Amen. And he's not done yet. So Barnabas is, is thinking, well, I've got to have some help here. And of course, I'm reading into the text, but uh, there's, there's good reason for me to do this at this point, okay? So just trust me. And, um, and so Barnabas is looking around, and he's thinking, okay, uh, you know, Saul, whom I helped bring to Jerusalem to introduce to the early apostles, has basically been gone off. And, uh, and uh, so he has gone back to Tarsus, where he was from, and no doubt witnessing and all probably having these great visions and revelations. And he also worked down in other areas and that sort of thing. We know this. But in any case, Barnabas, being a great 
encourager that he is, thinks about Saul, and so he goes to find Saul. Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians, amen. Now, interestingly, you know, when Barnabas goes to look for Saul. This is not just like, hmm, I think I'll try this here, try this there. No, actually, this, the inference of this particular phrase here is, is a one of desperation. In fact, it's used in the same way when Joseph and Mary went to look for Jesus when he was a boy, when they thought he was lost. This is a frantic, energetic searching, okay? So he had a purpose in mind. Now think about you being in the heart of Barnabas for just a moment, and I want you to ask yourself, at what point in your recent life have you had this dynamic energy working in you to where you would want to seek out somebody else to come alongside of you because you have got this cadre of nude Christians who are just growing in their faith and you need some help. Barnabas was the kind of person who wasn't afraid to go look for somebody and go find him and get him to aid him in the work of teaching. And so if you are not sure about how to disciple somebody, then get somebody else to help you, amen. And get started and figure it out and learn it. I just want to encourage you. Now, when in 2 Timothy, kind of flipping back there just for a moment, Paul says to Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to reliable people or to faithful people. When he says, when he tells him this, he's using an imperative here. He's using a command. He's telling him to, to you need to do this. Amen. This is not just sort of an option that we have. Well, I think I feel like having a Bible study today. Well, that's wonderful and good, but God doesn't give us you know, the sort of like the whim effect. He wants us to be engaged and to do it, all right? So, uh, a few years ago, I, I was pressed to, to understand what makes real disciples. I was thinking about this. Okay, what makes a real disciple? In other words, how can I get a person who has a general love for God and they've been born again, and yet they're still struggling in their personal life, their personal problems, and maybe sometimes they kind of fall off the Christian wagon a little bit, and we're wondering, how can I get them back on? What kind of a change can I bring to their life? What do I have to teach them to get them from point A to, to Z in order to get them to grow in their Christian lives? And so God began to speak to me about discipleship, and I began to ask the question, why do some people grow in their Christian faith to the point where they become disciples themselves and others do not. Well, there's a book called Discipleship Essentials, which was given to me uh, by a guy named Greg Ogden, and he lists three primary ingredients as being necessary to produce maturity in Christ. And this could be for us too. In other words, you're asking yourself, well, how can I get from point A to point B? I need to grow. What are you talking to me about being a discipler? I need to grow. You may feel that way, but you know, chances are you actually know more than you think you do, and God can use you, amen. And I wanna encourage you in that. You might think, well, I don't know what I could teach. Well, listen, you need to be qualified. It's true, as Pastor Ron said on Sunday, we don't just give a scalpel and uh, you know, a couple of cool technological tools to just anybody to work, to work on people's brains, right? And so there is, it is important for people to be trained and taught up in the ways of God and for them to learn how to handle the word of God correctly. But the first thing we need in terms of discipleship essentials is relational vulnerability. What do I mean by that? This means honest, self-disclosing, and confessional relationships that give the Holy Spirit permission to remake us. In other words, if you're okay in church on Sunday, but you're not okay when you're alone on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, then you need to enter into some sort of relationship where you can be honest with a discipler. Amen. And you need to learn how to have relational vulnerability. 
I don't hear any amens there. Well, I'm not sure about opening my life up to somebody. Well, listen, God will lead you. He'll give you somebody that you could trust, somebody pastoral in your life, somebody that can, that can be a trusted friend and confidant that can pray with you. I love what Dr. David Shibley says, our great uh, missionary friend from Global Advance, whom you saw in one of the congratulatory videos uh, when we celebrated uh, Pastor Ron's uh, 25th anniversary and Miss Brenda's. And uh, one of the things that he says is that once a year he gets together with uh, a group of other men, and these are pastors and other leaders and that sort of thing, and they ask each other these questions. They say, have you been sleeping with anyone? Ha are you involved in any kind of sexual immorality? Uh, are you doing any drugs or do you have a drug problem or an alcohol problem? Are you addicted to pornography? And they ask these type of questions. Have you, been, have you stolen anything? Are you being financially honest in your dealings? And then the last question that they ask each other, looking at each other across the table, in the eye, they say, and have you now just lied to me? Hard to squirm out of that kind of thing. Relational vulnerability is good, okay? You know, it needs to be responsible. Like Pastor Ron says, responsible honesty it's important, but relational vulnerability is what we need in order to get us from A to Z. If you're unwilling to engage in a discipleship mentor relationship, then you need to check your heart and think about it because God wants to use somebody in your life, not just sermons on Sundays and Wednesdays, but he wants to use somebody in your life who could teach you the way to live for Jesus, amen? Amen. And then he wants to turn around and use you to teach somebody else how to live for Jesus because this thing's got to go on for the next 2,000 years till Jesus comes back. Amen. I hope he comes back, you know, tomorrow. That'd be great. But we have got to be involved in discipleship. Number two thing that we need, number two thing, that's really good English, isn't it? Beth Moreno's squirming back there in his seat. English teacher. The centrality of truth. The second thing is what we need is in the centrality of truth. Now that I'm thinking about it, I can't speak at all. That's crazy. All right. <clears throat> the centrality of truth in a discipleship mentoring relationship is emphasized when people open their lives to one another around the truth of God's word and the Lord begins to re rebuild our lives from the inside out. And I will just say this. Many of us have these built-in mechanisms that enable us to think the very best about ourselves at all times in all situations. In other words, we basically lie to ourselves. And when we look in the mirror, we always look better than we actually do, don't we? Many of us live our lives having developed certain mechanisms that help us by protecting ourselves or to enable us to get what we need or want by manipulation of the facts and circumstances or the emotions of people. While some of these aspects of basic human interaction are positive, we do bring with us the baggage of how we used to live into the Christian life and we think subconsciously perhaps that we are saved but my basic life skills and coping mechanisms should remain basically the same. In other words, I think as Pastor Ron may have alluded to this the other day, we sort of just added Jesus to our balanced life. Whereas Jesus does not want to be added to our life, he wants to be our life. This is a fundamental difference here. I would submit that it's necessary that we change our basic understanding of how to live life and that only happens through real and personal discipleship. Now listen, if you're engaged in helping somebody learn about Jesus, this is not mystery, okay? This is not some, some strange, you know, uh, strange thing that we're doing. This is not mysterious. This is just real human interaction where you're imparting to somebody else and you're helping them grow. And it, can, it doesn't have to be necessarily even in a structured environment. We call what Jesus did with his 12 disciples, the fancy term is the peripatetic school. That means he taught them as he walked around with them, okay? And, and that's what Deuteronomy tells us to do, Deuteronomy 6. 
These things you will teach to your children when you're walking with them by the way, when you're sitting at the table, when you're putting them to bed, you're getting them back up. And of course, I'm, you know, I'm expounding on, I mean, you know, I'm sort of extrapolating from the word of God. But basically, in every situation and in any time that's, that's right, share with your kids. And by the way, that's our first discipleship responsibility, isn't it? Share with your kids the very truths that captured your heart to make sure they get the same Jesus and the same Holy Spirit that you got. Amen. And then thirdly, we need mutual accountability. This means authority given to others to hold us accountable to mutually agreeable standards where iron sharpens iron. Jesus stayed on the earth to raise up runners for the next lap. Unbelievers become believers. Believers become disciples. Disciples become leaders. Leaders become fathers, and fathers become leaders of leaders. Do you see the path? Okay? Unbelievers become believers. Believers become disciples. Disciples become leaders. Leaders become fathers. Fathers become leaders of leaders. Pastor Ron, you remember some time ago, he talked about how the Lord had impressed on his heart, how the Lord spoke to him and said, I have shown you my son that you may know me. Now show me your sons that I may know you challenged him in the area of discipleship, didn't he? We must make disciples. To disciple and be discipled means you need relationship with the Lord and other people. Mark 3, 14, Jesus, and he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might, number one, be with him, and two, he might send them out to preach. So you see, if you're going to disciple somebody, you need to first be with the Lord. You need to be spending time with him. You need to get to know him better and in his word. And you need to prepare your heart so that God can speak to you and mold you and make you into who he wants you to be. And then you can get sent out or he will send you out or he will bring people to you that are hungry to be taught. In 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, we have, back to this again, we have at least four main concepts relative to to discipleship. Number one, we have commitment. This is the word entrust. Okay, this is a consistent and personal entrusting over time and intimates a consistent, persistent entrusting a period of time to reliable people. So first we entrust, and who do we entrust to? We trust reliable people. So if you want to do something for Jesus, show yourself faithful and he will give you more to be faithful over. Amen? Number two, connection. We got to have connection to Christ and one another, many others as witnesses. This is to many others. You know, the things that you've heard me talk about, you commit to others who'll be able to teach others also. And I did it among many witnesses. This is not uh, truth that's hidden in a corner. You don't have to corner somebody to tell them your special revelation. This is basic Bible truth, how Jesus got a hold of your life, what the Word of God is, how to pray, how to witness, how to give, how to be moral, how to, you know, just how to do, how to do the Christian thing. Amen. <laughs> and then we have content. He says, and the things. In other words, there's something you're communicating to your disciples. Content. It's the word of God, and it's also a reliable understanding and interpretation of God's ways and his expectation. Now, look at 2 Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Okay? Notice there is teaching going on here, and Paul says, Look, and listen, you guys stand firm. You know, the first time Paul visited Thessalonica and was evangelizing there, he only spent three weeks. And a church was birthed out of that that had dramatic, it had dramatic results, and he stayed close to them. And he communicated them amazing stuff in just a short time he was there, and then probably later on. Of course, as he wrote First and Second Thessalonians and then also sent, sent word by Timothy and probably Titus, if I recall correctly. But notice, hold to the traditions. This is like the stuff I passed on to you about Jesus and his word that you were taught by us either by our spoken word, 
okay? Or by our letter. So we have what the fancy term is orality. In other words, you communicate truth by speaking it, and you have textuality. You communicate truth by what's written down, all right? And you could do this by word of encouragement by writing a letter tonight to somebody. Amen. Try not to shout me down. All right, continuance is the last thing. There's reproduction. Give it and teach it to the next generation. Let's look at our important points, and I've got a thousand more, but the important points are Jesus told us to go and make disciples. Secondly, disciples are disciplined followers of Jesus and his disciples. To make disciples, we must be disciples. And lastly, we must raise up the next generation to follow Jesus. Amen. No matter what age and stage of life you are in, you must raise up others to follow Jesus. Amen.